wants more of your money for parking. The story of Jim Johnson and more. Thank you for tuning Thank you for tuning in tonight. I'm your anchor, Michelle Seven. In local news, the Keene City Council will be needing new blood just as the mayor has recently announced that he will not be seeking re-election. So too have at least four of the ten city councilors whose terms are ending this fall. Nathaniel Stout, Timothy Dunn, Cynthia Georgina, and Kendall Lane are stepping down from their respective re seats on the city council. Kendall Lane plans to run for mayor, and James Duffy will be giving up his seat to run for Lane's Ward 4 seat, which carries a four-year term. Reasons cited included the budget, which some of the councillors indicate will be a problem in the coming years. With so many positions open, it presents Keene with an opportunity for new ideas and new leadership. The City of Keene wants more of your money for parking. City officials are looking at replacing the individual parking meters in Keene with a kiosk that covers multiple spaces. To pay for your parking, one would have to walk up to the proper kiosk, pick the proper parking location, and insert money. Keene Police Chief Ken Miola believes this could lead to a 30% increase in meter revenue. It would also prevent piggybacking or parking in a space that already has money in the meter. This is done by removing the time left indication from the meter and keeping it secret. Ostensibly, even a person who put money in would not be able to view the time left. The machines cost ten to twelve thousand dollars each, with an installation cost of between twenty-five hundred and thirty-five hundred dollars, according to the parking department. Pending the city council's approval, the plan would include installing two borrowed machines on Main Street as a trial. A committee headed up by Chairwoman Cynthia Georgina voted to recommend the City Council approve the plan. The City's estimated income from parking meters is just under $400,000 for last year. Ian Freeman, host of Free Talk Live, a nationally syndicated radio show and owner of Freekeen.com, was found guilty of obstructing police at a trial this past Wednesday. Here is some footage of his sentencing before J John Arnold. The recommendation of the state is the sentence that was imposed in district court, which, as we discussed earlier, was a $500 fine plus pen penalty assessment, 360 days at the House of Corrections, with 300 of that suspended two years on condition of the defendant's good behavior, and he has one day pretrial confinement credit. So I would suggest time served, no fine. Oh, was a 360-day sentence of the House of Correction, 270 days of the sentence is suspended doing good behavior in compliance with all terms and conditions of disorder. Any suspended sentence may be imposed after hearing at the request of the state brought within two years. One day of pre-child confinement credit is noted. Uh, other conditions of the sentence are uh, that you are to participate in meaningfully complete any counseling, treatment, and educational programs as directed by the Correctional Authority, Probation, and Parole Officer, and you order to be a good behavior in compliance with all terms and conditions any questions? Did I understand you correctly? You're sentencing at 90 days in the House of Corrections. You understand correctly. At this point, Commander of the Customs. I would like to appeal this, uh, this sentence. Uh, do I get to stay the sentence upon pending appeal? You no. Know. You may have noticed a sign at Central Square this past week. A group of local activists staged an outreach event at Central Square in Keene on Monday and Tuesday. The event was held in the afternoon and caused a buzz in the city center. The activists put out a video explaining what was going on. Here is a clip of that video. Hi, my name is Alan Gunter. I'm here in Keene, New Hampshire, Town Square, uh, doing a little jury nullification outreach. And what we have behind us here are a series of eight signs because there's three things that the people have in order to control our government. The voting box, the jury box, a redress of grievance. Those are the only three things that the people have against a tyrannical government. Uh, today it's a little rainy, but uh, yesterday we gave out 400 flyers. Um, everyone, most everyone was receptive. We're out here to let the local community know that the jury trial is, is where the people can really make a difference. It's not just guilty or not guilty. We have a right to judge the law. We have a duty to judge the law. 
For our panel discussion this evening, we are joined by Jason Repture and our special guest, Adana Freeman. What are your thoughts on tonight's stories, Jason? Well, I, I think um, Cynthia, Cynthia abandoning ship after um, all these city council members abandoning ship after putting all this in place, all these extra costs, I, I think it's um, kind of hypocritical or to throw, I guess, other members in place. I don't know. What do you think about that? I think it's definitely one of the biggest flaws in uh, government of any kind is terms where these individuals can come in and towards the end of a term, I mean, how long ago did these folks know that they were or weren't running and yet they're voting on things like $10,000 kiosks, uh, educational systems. Uh, they don't really have the incentive to make the right decision. Uh, Cynthia even at one point stated that she was in favor of piggybacking and that you know having the convenience of going right to the meter in front of you was uh, a good thing and now she also introduced the bill to spend tens of thousands of dollars um, you know on a whim basically. Oh totally I mean in a time I guess you could say of um, economic I guess turmoil in a sense you know unemployment everything is you know the highest it's ever been and here this five-year master plan that they put in place City Council is all about increasing the budget and um, it just, it, it really doesn't uh, make a lot of sense. I mean, where is this money going to come from? I mean, um, you know, with everything tanking right now. Well, exactly. They, they quote in there that it, in the story that it said it'd be a 30% increase in parking revenue. Well, why? Because they're going to rip you off because there is no more piggybacking. You know, you have to walk down to the meter and get it. Some might not do that, which would be increased fines. Mm -hmm. Some that do will pay for a half hour, leave in 15 minutes. Someone else will pull in for five minutes, pay for a half hour leave again and the, they're going to double bank and rip people off. I mean, the city council, the people who represent government, I, I don't know what you, but they should be, uh, what you think, but they should be here to protect you, spend your money wisely, do the best decisions, and I can't see anything good coming out of the kiosk situation or the parking changes. Sure, and I've actually heard, I don't know if it's accurate or not, but actually to enforce um, parking meter laws actually cost more than what they actually the revenue that it generates. I don't know if you've heard that before or if that's an accurate statement. I haven't I haven't heard, but uh, I, it could make sense to me, you know, yeah. financially that 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 would be the cost. I mean, you have meter maids too, I think, that are here in Keene that uh, run around. And you know, another thing is that people who try to do good, there's a folks out there with uh, freekeen.com that do Robin Hooding, and that's essentially where if you see some, on a meter that's expired, you put a quarter in there really quick and save that person a ten dollar ticket. Uh, this will eliminate that. So even the community wanting to help the community out on its own, the city council has now gone and removed that, you know, freedom. If you just want to help your neighbor out, if you pay your quarter, see your neighbor doesn't have one, I'd like to be a good guy. Can't do that anymore, you know? Oh, sure. And as it is, I don't even believe in, I guess, the parking meters as long when it's on um, public property, so to speak. But, you know, for sake of argument, you know, sure. I mean, um, I'll just go with it. Okay, they're there now. Why do they need this, this new system, uh, this new kiosk system? I mean, the one they have now, I mean, seems to generate money just fine. I mean, why do they have to go and spend all these outrageous amounts, especially, like I said, with everything tanking right now? Exactly. The only way I could see them making 30% more money is by ripping people off. It's by the lack of piggybacking. So, yeah, if it's not broke, don't fix it. And really, I mean, if this is what the city council and the, the you know, keen city government wants to do to make money and cut shortfalls, then we really should start looking at what we should be allowing them to do. I think a best solution, start the conversation where it begins, Let's get King City out of you know the roads and the par the parking meters. Let's let a good, honest businessman do it, and uh, get them out of that burden of public property. But exactly. Um, but in reference, to, I don't know if you um, wanted to talk about now the whole Ian thing. I mean, what did you think about um, Judge Arnold and I guess the sentence that he laid out for Ian? I mean, yeah, uh, the sentence seemed really harsh. I mean, I know there was uh, folks uh, out there to show support. Um, last year, Ian had sat in front of a police car. He wasn't happy with what the police were doing. And again, this is a, a problem that we have in today's society where, you know, a large group of individuals are, be, are paying for a service and yet we don't agree on it. So, you know, what are some of the solutions the keen people can do? I mean, I don't know. What do you think? Oh, gosh. Well, when it comes to um, generating revenue? Well, for the police protection, I mean, Ian, didn't, Ian observed them arresting a woman in the park who was enjoying a beverage. He didn't oh, sure. approve of that, you know? What other choice does oh. he have? He can't stop paying them. He can't hire their competitor. Yeah. You know, he chose a peaceful act. And now, you know, he's not only is he being punished, but everybody else who wasn't there that Sunday last July, um, 
you know, is being punished via taxation for it. You know, he's going to do yeah. 90 days in the House of Corrections at like 60 bucks a day. Oh, sure. I mean, I guess the, the best answer to that is, you know, they need to stop harassing people for these victimless crimes. I mean, the, the cost is just a astronomical what it, what's costing the community. So um, I guess if more people um, actually broke these laws, in, in a sense, I guess not, they couldn't actually sustain themselves. Well, to, hopefully, to pay for it. I mean, exactly. I mean, hopefully one day people start to understand their wallets. And with that, we uh, take it over to Michelle. Thank you, Damon and Jason. On June 29th, Cheshire County Superior Court demanded Liberty activist Jim Johnson attend a court hearing in reference to an unpaid fine from several weeks prior, where Jim was found guilty of trespassing on Cheshire County jail property. At the hearing, Jim was told by Judge John P. Arnold he needed to fill out a financial affidavit so the court could determine whether or not he could pay the fine. Jim's moral opposition for paying to the state prevented him from doing so. However, he did offer to pay the fine to a local charity, community service, or through time served at $50 a day, all of which were denied. When Jim refused to fill out the affidavit, he was held in contempt of court by Judge, jo uh, Judge Arnold and jailed indefinitely. On that day, Free Keen TV was there to capture the events that transpired. Hi, my name is Jim Johnson. I live in Winchester, New Hampshire. I was uh, arrested for walking around the uh, jail out here in Keene, New Hampshire, and I had a hearing in front of Judge Burke on uh, a trespassing for walking around there at the jail. There was 12 of us arrested. Then I had a trial in front of uh, Judge John Arnold in uh, Superior Court, and in both cases I was found guilty. The Judge Arnold case was a jury trial, so uh, I had 12 New Hampshire citizens say I was guilty of trespassing out there, but uh, of the 12 people that were arrested out there, it was like three of them whose charges were dropped. We were all arrested together in one group, so charges dropped. One of the uh, people was found not guilty. One of the people had to spend 13 days in jail over it. Others got uh, community service or you know, was able to work off a fine. And for my attempt to uh, prove myself uh, innocent uh, in, uh, in front of a superior court, I got 21 days of jail and uh, a $650 fine. It's kind of a telling uh, portrayal of uh, New Hampshire justice. I was taken to a hearing for non-payment of fine. The judge wanted me to, to fill out a piece of paperwork that, uh, that basically stated all of my financial matters, uh, what property I owned, you know, how much money I made, how much money my wife made, how, many, how much assets she had, and so I said I would not fill out such a, a form because I didn't have to provide any evidence for or against myself in a court, and uh, I was thrown in jail until I filled out that form. Your case, this is a matter of the state of New Hampshire versus uh, James Johnson. The matter before the court today is a hearing to show cause, Mr. Johnson, why you have not paid the fine, which was probably your sentence, which the court issued on uh, March 21st. Uh, it's my understanding that you have been provided with a financial affidavit, which you have declined to complete, is that correct? I don't know what that piece of paper was. I don't know what that piece of paper was. Well, now that you know what it is, are you prepared to fill it out? I am not. Does the state have anything they wish to say with respect to Mr. Johnson's fine? With respect to the fine, Your Honor, um, if the defendant wanted to pay but cannot, the state certainly would agree more time for him to pay. If he can pay but refuses to, then it's a matter of contempt. And it was part of the show. Um, whatever penalty for that contempt to be deemed appropriate. Well, it's difficult to determine what Mr. Johnson's financial situation is since he declines to fill out a financial affidavit. So I would say to you, Mr. Johnson, that uh, if you decline to fill out a financial affidavit, uh, you're going to find you in contempt and you'll be taken downstairs and held at the House of Correction. If you want to fill out the financial affidavit, we will determine whether you have the ability to pay or, or not. The, the option is yours. I don't have to provide any evidence for or against me at this trial. That's fine. And at this point, you're in the custody of the show. For what period? Otherwise? I'm finding in contempt as I, as I, 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 I will be 
held pending payment of the fine or completion of financial affidavit. If you complete the financial affidavit, we can again assess whether you have the ability to pay. If you decline to do it, uh, you'll be held until the fine is paid. So it's a debtor's prison thing? I'm not going to debate the issue with you, Mr. Johnson. You understand well, the option? I can't, I, I can't pay anything. I don't know whether you can or not until you fill out the financial affidavit. So you have a choice of filling out the financial affidavit and we will revisit it or you will be held until the fine is paid. Thank you for bringing Mr. Johnson back. So indefinitely? Yep. An indefinite order. So he can, he can coerce you into signing a document? Yep. I initially thought that I would get $50 a day credit for being in jail, but uh, that was not the case. On the 14th day, I decided, well, I better fill out this piece of paperwork. They had held me in uh, solitary confinement uh, those 14 days and uh, in a very cold cell. After being tortured in the cold and lonely there for a while, I filled out the paperwork and then uh, I was taken down to the court and the paperwork did not satisfy the judge. And he said I had to pay the $650, otherwise I would be there for the rest of forever, actually. So for $650, the, uh, the state of New Hampshire was willing to hold somebody in jail for the rest of their lives. I initially planned to be there you know, for quite a while anyway, probably up to a year, but then I thought, well, then I'll be here a year, and at the end of the year I'll still have to pay the $650. So I thought, well, that's, uh, that's not going to work for me. So. I asked for people to, to help put up the, the money, so I got out for that in front of John Arnold, the judge there in Superior Court. The justification behind uh, holding somebody for uh, because they owe the state money or anybody money is, uh, has been ludicrous right from the beginning. I mean, they, they used to have debtors' prisons and uh, they give you $50 a day credit, but uh, they're spending you know, $150, $200 a day to keep you there. There's absolutely no sense in that whatsoever you know, for these piddling amounts of money and how much the state spends. It's, uh, it's completely ridiculous what the, uh, well, everything the state does is pretty ludicrous. Yeah. Jim remained in Cheshire County Jail for 21 days. 14 of those, he was placed in segregation since he was being held on a contempt charge. Segregation consists of being contained in a cell for 23 hours a day in conjunction with many other harsh conditions. Only after Jim was assured he would be in jail for the rest of his life until the fine was paid, he accepted bail money for his release. Typically, judges impose jail time at $50 a day until a fine is paid, but Jim received no money towards his fine for time served. Currently, some people are pursuing grievances under the new grievance committee option in Concord against Judge Arnold on this matter. Once again, we turn to our discussion panel. Ademo, what do you make of Jim's situation? Jim's situation is awful. Uh, I've been in segregation. I know what that's like. I can't imagine uh, sitting in there for 14 days. Um, I don't know how many people knew this goes on or that, that know this goes on in Keene, but uh, there definitely needs to be something needs to be done about the off, the uh, way the judges here in town are holding people in contempt for lengthy sentences at a high expense of taxpayers. What do you think? Yeah, I, I think they're they act a lot like a criminal um, or, or basically an organized crime family. I mean, in Jim's situation, you know. They basically gave him an offer he couldn't refuse. Uh, you know, I mean, that's exactly what it is. I mean, they, they pretty much, they put you in a cold cell and um, they, you know, they put your back against the wall and that he actually went, uh, you know, he had to eventually go against his morals and everything and um, accept money from the state to get out because it's not a bluff either. I mean, they'll keep him in there until he pays it just to prove their, le you know, legitimacy. Exactly. For anybody who hasn't been to jail, I mean, when they go to jail, I mean, the first few days in there are them telling you that hey, we are in control. You know, they put you in a, a holding cell and booking, then they ask you a bunch of questions repeatedly in the booking and the classifications. They hold you in 23-hour lockdown. It's to let you know uh, who's boss. And I don't know about anybody else, but I wouldn't pay for this service. I wouldn't voluntarily give my money to somebody to do this to Jim. And the fact that our tax dollars were used, to it, used for it really irritates me. And I think that uh, it would most people if they knew what Judge Arnold and what Judge Burke were up to these days. Sure. And especially when you look at just how it all boiled down to not filling out an affidavit. Right. So, I mean, it just to me, that's obviously very extreme, especially when, you know, most people don't realize. I mean, 
Um, you know, he's not just in jail for 21 days, he's in solitary confinement for, you know, 14, a big portion of the, those days, and it's, it's, it's pretty harsh, I mean, I can... <laughs> right, this is why, I mean, I don't know if some folks have seen me down, and yourself as well, Jason, at the uh, district court doing don't take the plea deal outreach. Uh, this is why it's effective. I mean, right now you had Ian and um, Jim who didn't take plea deals, and yes, they're paying for it in time in jail, and uh, everyone's like, that might scare you, but if there was 50 Ians and if there was 50 Jims, then the court would literally crumble under its own weight. You know, these threats, they, they would keep them up, but they wouldn't be able to financially back them. They wouldn't have the jail space, they wouldn't have the courtrooms and other stuff. So what do you think about uh, don't take the plea deal outreach? Oh, yeah, I think it's great, just like what you said. I mean, the system would not be able to sustain itself if people stopped taking the plea deal. It, I mean, the whole system is based on people take, you know, they rack up a bunch of charges against people, they put their backs against the wall, and people actually get to the point where they thank the government, or they thank the state, I mean, um, when they I impose a, a lighter deal. system. Yeah, they think they get such a great deal because they're facing five years for doing something piddly. Right. And so when they only get, you know, three months and this much probation, oh, it's a great deal, and they're, right. they're they happily take it and they happily pay it. Right, all they really know. did with the, by taking the plea deal was prolonging the suffering of, like, the war on drugs yeah. or underage drinking, you know, all these things that uh, burden the system if people would stop paying. You know, it's revenue generating sure. for the city, just like the parking meters. I mean, it's all about money. I mean, everything they're doing down in City Hall is to generate money to do other things. Sure. Some might be good, but where does the money come from in the beginning, you know, so. And, oh yeah, and, and they prove it too when um, Jim Johnson, I mean, he, he offered to pay it to a charity. He offered to do community service. Right. And, as, and what's as wrong with that? Yeah, exactly. Right. Why, why wouldn't the system take that? That's right. a great thing. I, you, know? I, you know, as a citizen or a resident or whatever you'd like to call me, a person who lives inside of Keene, I would have loved to see Jim Johnson, it, 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 like, I shouldn't say love to see his money under the circumstances, but I'd rather see him donate to a charity that would directly affect the community as opposed to give it to the state who's going to put in $10,000 kiosks and hire another police officer to you know, harass people for victimless crimes. I'd rather see it go to somebody in need than uh, through a force. But Judge Arnold wouldn't allow that to happen. Judge Burke doesn't allow that to happen. You know, Judge Burke had me arrested once for you know, asking him questions. I mean, these two guys are definitely out of control and they're costing the city of Keene uh, a lot of time, money, and you know, giving, you, giving folks a bad name, you know? Yeah. Tourism is, is good at, at coming up this time of year, and I don't know how good it would be if you know, jails are full and people are upset and downtown parking is a mess and sure. whatever. Yeah, but all this to basically uh, prove their legitimacy, you know, I mean, to prove how um, their importance, I mean, they're um, willing to basically spend a large amount of money on these, you know, on the jail actually, what, I think like 40 million and stuff just to um, house 160 some people. And, you know, I mean, 10, you know, probably 10 out of that bunch are actually violent criminals and all the rest are just thrown in for victimless. Oh you know, yeah, crimes. I mean, Rick I mean, Van Winkler, who is the superintendent of the jail, has told me, you know, that he had 200 inmates in there once, seven of them were violent offenders and that the system is based off of coercion. But again, it's all uh, coming around to don't take the plea deal, which I think we have a clip coming up right around now. Great. We can gum up the system, we can clog it up, we can essentially monkey wrench it by stopping and taking plea deals and encouraging our friends to not take the plea deal. So it's Tuesday, we're doing the don't take the plea deal outreach. Today I'm doing don't take the plea deal outreach, but I also brought some living on tour flyers. We are doing don't take the plea deal outreach. Spiffy uh, trifolds that were designed by uh, Mike McLean and uh, some other folks up here. And so they're originals to the CD Evolution Fund and Free Keen uh, graphics on the back. And on the inside is a lot of detail. And you can go to tools.freekeen.com. You can actually download a PDF of this. And there's two different versions. There's one that's specific to New Hampshire, and there's another one that's national. So this is something that is pretty easy to duplicate uh, on a local basis. You don't need a, a whole lot of people to, to do this. So I would recommend that if you're going to do it in your area, that you do have more than one person, maybe two, three people, especially for a little while while they get used to you, because you may have a police response that could be negative in the beginning. Like around here, they know who we are. It's no big deal. Uh, but essentially, the, uh, the job is to greet people as they, uh, as they come to work, and also to greet the, uh, the victims of the court as they come in 
as they are in your area and all across the country to deal with a bunch of mostly BS charges like possession of marijuana or open container or you know you name it speeding tickets etc so this encourages them to uh, to not take the plea deal which the people in court will make them an offer uh, it'll sound good because the what they're facing is pretty overwhelming it's pretty scary and so then they give them this plea deal where it's a much reduced sentence and they can just you know get it over with and they can go and pay the fine or if they're too poor which many of them are they can go and get on a payment plan and then pay 20% more because they're on a payment plan and it's all about extracting as much money as possible from all the people that are coming in without actually having to do any kind of work, without actually having to, uh, you know, to, to build a case and to present a case in front of a court or in front of a jury, etc. So this basically just encourages people to say no to the plea deal, take something to trial, even if it's a $5 parking ticket to make it so the state calling themselves a state, have to spend whatever amount it costs them to take your ticket or your charge to a trial, actually have to prove their case, come up with discovery, call the witnesses, take an hour of their time, maybe more than an hour, and that way it's costing them money to deal with you if they, if they write out these tickets. And the idea is if more people were to do that, it would really crush the system because at least here in New Hampshire, and maybe it's true in other places, uh, around here, they're very, uh, Thanks for that uh, video. Uh, as you can see, Ian Freeman there, who is now spending 90 days in a cage, uh, he did something gr very interesting at his trial, and he advocated to the jury in not so many words, jury nullification. Can you tell us a little bit about what jury nullification is, Jason? Yeah, actually, um, the funny thing is the fact that Ian instructed about jury. I mean, it used to, the judge actually used to be required to instruct the jurors about that, but now they leave it up to then actually even a lot of times you can't even mention it in court now these days, but basically what jury nullification is that people can judge the law based on the, I guess the morality or the value of the law, basically what they, you know, they could basically overrule if they feel something is a bad law. People have that power. It's basically the last, um, I guess, what is it, the last resort or it's the last stand that a person can make um, in the system, I guess you could say. I mean, there's been so many bad laws throughout history and especially when you look at um, some of the unethical things when it was the Underground Railroad or slavery or anything like that and um, you know people had the option you could say hey that's a bad law that people were being thrown in jail and people would judge it on that merit. Exactly I would love to see more people get into a court when you're at a trial forget about get innocent not guilty vote with your conscience do what's right if no one was harmed no victim no crime. Exactly. With that then we're gonna head over to Michelle. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Check back next week, next Monday at 7, for another episode of Free Keen TV. As always, if you wish to contact us, please send an email to tv at freekeen.com. I'm Michelle Seven. Peace be with you and yours. Good night.